Okay, welcome everybody. We are ready to start with the with the session. My name is Marco Horvat, and I will be your chair uh, for this session. And uh, yes, I am glad to tell you that we are we are ready to start with the session numerics efficiency and software too. Uh, our first speaker will be Mr. Uh, Matej Chorak. Uh, he is a PhD student from University of Zagreb, and he will be giving his talk on the eigen, eigen spectrum of a finite volume matrix. So hello to everyone. My name is Matej Chorak, and I'm coming from Zagreb. And today I, I will hold a presentation with the title The Eigen Spectrum of a Finite Volume Matrix. So this is the overview of today's presentation. It is divided in six chapters, and it will start with the introduction. So for the introduction, I would like you to show you what is the connection between eigen spectrum and coefficient matrices uh, which were obtained uh, from the finite volume discretization. So as we know, discretization procedure yields linear system uh, with the coefficient matrices which have the uh, same number of rows and columns as the computational mesh. And the uh, main objective of this presentation would be to show how to use the cheapest method to uh, calculate the eigenspectrum. Uh, why we need the eigenspectrum, I will sh uh, show you later, and we can start. So, uh, as you know, discretization yields sparse square matrices with symmetric addressing. And as an example, I took, so we took the Poisson pressure equation for incompressible Navier-Stokes Navier system uh, for a simple algorithm which yields a positive uh, definite matrix. And for that Poisson pressure equation, we used um, AMG linear solver as the most efficient option. And as we know, for AMG solver, we need to use a smoother. So some efficient smoothers are Gauss Eider or ILU. And let's focus on ILU. It has drawback so uh, actually not LU but uh, LU just lower upper factorization have drawback that has memory overhead uh, so to prevent memory overhead we use ILU factorization uh, but ILU factorization in this case have also some drawbacks for example it it could have uh, some convergence problem and it does not scale scale linearly because uh, it has intensive communication between processing units. So to deal with that, the idea is to use polynomial smoothers. For example, uh, Chebyshev polynomials, which only, has, uh, which only need the largest and the smallest eigenvalues, and they have continu continuous minimization properties. Uh, other polynomial smoothers is one of them is multi-level smoother polynomial, which is uh, which have uh, which only uh, need the largest eigenvalue. And here, here are some iterative algorithms which were used for finding eigenvalues. I list some of them, and uh, these here listed have some drawbacks, and maybe uh, these drawbacks is something because they didn't use them. So for example, Jacobi eigenvalue algorithm uh, have main drawback of intense memory and CPU usage uh, because it needs to uh, perform matrix rotations. And then QR decomposition have also have drawback of intensive CPU and memory, uh, um, have drawback of uh, CPU and memory intensive matrix producting. And last one is power iteration, which it's maybe better than these two because it only uh, it calculates largest and smallest eigenvector, which is needed for which actually we need, and it is effective for large sparse matrices. But uh, as an answer to these drawbacks, the uh, idea was to use Grzegorian circle theorem to finding eigenspectrum. So, what is actually this theorem? It is uh, theorem from, for bounding spectrum of square matrix. As we can see here on the picture on the right, uh, these circles, and these circles represent uh, area where uh, eigenvalues would be. And how do we get these circles? We can get circular radius as 
sum of all non-diagonal elements in the matrix and the center of the circle is the diagonal element. So idea was to use Grzegorian circle theorem for determining largest and smallest eigenvalue. Uh, this picture is showed ideal uh, scenario which is not in the not common in practice. As we can see, red and the uh, blue dots, it represents smallest and the largest values. But uh, this case probably wouldn't be in the real life. So to uh, look what it would lo look like in the real uh, simulations, I done some test cases for cavity and backward facing step test cases with different uh, cell types, hexahedral and tetrahedral for different cell sizes and mesh uniformities. Uh, first one is for the cavity test case, which is the most simplest. It has 25 hexahedral cells. As we can see on the left side, it is uniform mesh and it is done for the pressure equation. And here we can see circles. So we can see uh, blue and the red dot blue representing smallest value, red uh, largest. As we can see, the blue dot is exactly where it should be, but the red dot it isn't. It should be here on the on this crossing, but it is different from that. And this 13.6% per difference is exactly what it needs to be to the, this crossing. So in the other in picture, I show the whole uh, eigenspectrum, which uh, we can see where these eigenvalues are clustered. It will help in the later stages of research, let's say. And this, this, uh, these three pictures represent our uh, coarsening algorithm of AMG solver on the most left picture is the first step when the mesh is the finest and then it goes to the coarsest mesh. As we can see that circles are, on the first picture we can see that circles are stacked uh, one, uh, they are over, overlapping so we can, we can see all of them. And as, uh, as uh, algorithm pro, uh, goes we can see that uh, circles are moving from each other and we can see different results. Uh, the other test case is done for exactly the same mesh with 25 cells but for velocity equation and we can see that it doesn't work and the answer why it doesn't work is because uh, this matrix is asymmetric and positive defined. Uh, next test case is done as the first one but with finer mesh uh, now with 625 uh, cells, again for pressure equation, and here we can see the results are better than before, with only 0.4% uh, difference. Again, same was done, but for the same mesh, but with non-uniform uh, cell spacing. And here we can see a lot more circles because of different uh, cell sizes. Again, the different uh, smallest value is almost correct, and the largest one is uh, only 4.2% uh, different from the actual value. Same was done, but with the tetrahedral cells for pressure equation. And here we can see that the result is not really that good. And because of that, I want I, I didn't do, uh, done any other uh, simulations with tetrahedral cells. And same was done with uh, backward facing step, which is done first for hexahedral cells for uniform mesh and pressure equation. On the left, there is a test case with the mesh, and on the right is the circles. Here we can see different orders of the circle than before in the cavity test case, but uh, we can see the result is better than better than other type of, of meshing before. Uh, same was done again, but now with a non-uniform mesh, and we can see that the result is uh, worse than before for, so this result is worse than for a uniform mesh. And 
Um, so in that, uh, I can conclude that uh, results are most accurate for hexahedral uniform meshes. And actually this theorem idea was to use something uh, very simple to calculate eigenvalues, but we can see it doesn't work well. So definitely there, um, there is a lot of work to be done to finding some alternative way to uh, calculating these values and to validate results. Uh, I put that validating result because I use one software which doesn't allow me uh, uh, calculating eigenvalues with the matrices more uh, which has more than thousand elements so it's quite limiting for now and that's it if you have any questions please oh, sorry Thank you very much, Mate, uh, for a very interesting presentation. Are there any questions for, from the audience? Okay, we have one here. I don't want to not cover the camera. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you what do you want to do with uh, eigenvalues? <laughs> I guess. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Um, I want to use it uh, to find. Uh, so, in MG. I, I want to use it as a, uh, I want to use it for a smoothing procedure in MG solver. And the idea is to use it with the Chebyshev of polynomials. And for that, I need to find the maximum and minimum uh, eigenvalues. So I'm finding the, which is the maybe mo most cheap way to uh, finding these values. Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I was wanting to ask the the same the, the same questions before, but I think it might be valuable to distinguish between two things: computing all eigenvalues or computing only the lowest and the highest one. Because the second case, your goal is to compute bounds for a polynomial smoother, and yours in between are not required. So you might be able to skip over them and concentrate instead the the two extremes. So yes, that this is the idea to found only smallest and the largest one because I only need that actually. Then but a, a power method might be what you would do. I think so, and I will definitely try to uh, present you next time uh, implementation of it. Any other questions? Let me just quickly check if somebody from the online audience. Uh, seems like there isn't. Hey, thank you very much, Mate. Okay. Okay, our next speaker is going to be myself, actually. This is going to be a bit of a different, different, different topic than what you are used to seeing here. I'll be talking about introducing a project that I'm involved with, and I will introduce a very, very, very useful software platform that was this, uh, that was developed by Dr. Henrik Rusche over here. And uh, how are we? How do we want to use this platform uh, in the in in the project? Uh, I will also be giving you, uh, if you are interested, uh, a way uh, instructions on how to uh, how to implement uh, OpenFOAM as one of the components of this platform. 
because you're able to do very interesting things with it. Uh, and uh, as an example, uh, you can just take a look at the Modena European project that uh, took place five, six years ago, something like that. Yes. And uh, they were working on on a way how to grow uh, polyurethane fo foams uh, and how to how to handle this type of uh, multi-scale simulations. Okay. So first, let me introduce uh, the Whipcode. It's a it's a project that is mainly focused on uh, developing a virtual uh, open innovation platform uh, for active coatings. So basically, the motivation for the project is uh, <coughs> there have been uh, uh, many restrictions from the European Union on how can uh, protective coatings be uh, be manufactured, and uh, they have banned one of the most important uh, component in the coatings. So uh, manufacturers are now no longer able to, to use chromates which were pretty much the base the, the basis of the of the production of anti-corrosive paints so what has happened the the initiative was uh, was uh, uh, was started uh, and now we are working with uh, many very interesting partners for example Airbus and uh, Axa Nobel who are very much interested in how are they going to move from their coatings that they uh, used to use uh, uh, pretty much predominantly and uh, what are they going to do? So what we, are, what we are doing for them is we are developing an open innovation platform. So uh, open innovation is uh, a process where we're developing something new, right? We have to create an environment where researchers will be able to come, uh, their ideas, uh, start uh, a pro create a project proposals, and in the end start the project. And we have to an environment where they are able to collaborate and in the end, give them tools uh, to conduct their project. Tools are in the end uh, uh, hosted as a simulation. Simulation will be able to promote uh, the simulation that they, are, they need. So in the figure, you can see different layers of such structure. So uh, the first part is the, the part that we are, call, that we are uh, calling the business layer. Uh, so this is going to be you can think of it as a front end of of uh, of any web page uh, that uh, you that you you are visiting so you are we have to give uh, open access to it so that everybody can uh, can uh, log in register and start using the start using the the platform so this is um, done in the so called quadruple helix innovation method and quadruple helix is basically a a, a set of recommendations that are uh, recommending basically how to implement uh, many different uh, uh, partners and uh, here what is important is many different uh, uh, areas from where the partners uh, where, where the partners come from for example uh, there could be uh, uh, there could be participants for from government industry society research and so on and so on and so on and all of them have different goals when it comes to the innovation platform and how do they want to do innovation and what is their end goal in the end from such innovation uh, this uh, business platform uh, is uh, based on uh, on a business orchestrator that is called uh, Kamunda this is uh, an open source uh, open source platform that allows you to execute business uh, business logic so business logic here is um, defined in, in, in standards that uh, are called BPMN diagrams, uh, and uh, they allow you to, to, to control the process that you want to execute. Uh, and this is basically in between, uh, this is basically uh, serving a purpose of an interface between the front end and the back end where we want to execute simulations. Uh, the second part uh, is, uh, probably more interesting to, to everybody here uh, it's uh, the simulation simulation layer so what we want to do here is uh, we want to have a platform that will allow you to run uh, uh, multi-scale simulations and this is where uh, uh, Modena comes uh, very very much into play because uh, this platform this uh, layer is going to be based on on this software uh, the next uh, slides what I will be talking about is I will try to introduce you to, to Modena, and uh, I will talk a bit about the structure. Uh, I will talk about the role of the database in, in, uh, in the platform. I will talk about the workflow orchestrator, and uh, I will talk about the, the things that have been done on Modena from the end of the Modena project uh, up to now. So basically, the, what was the problem with Modena is that 
nobody touched the code for five years. And uh, as you know, when people don't use code, the code tends to die. And uh, this is the first thing that we tackled uh, here in the project. And uh, we basically made sure that uh, Modena can run with all the all the latest uh, all the latest uh, packages and dependencies. And finally, I will give you the example, short example. I can share a source code with you um, if you just send me an email. Uh, but I will show you uh, a short short tutorial, let's say, on how to um, how to couple OpenFOAM into 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 Modena. There is an example already exists, but it's very complicated, very complex. It uh, takes into account uh, very uh, specific dependencies that handle all the chemistry that was used for polyurethane foams. So why not have a simple example that, that everybody can understand and that uh, can show people how to, how to use the code? Okay, so this is pretty much a picture that, uh, that uh, should be clear, but I don't know if it is. Uh, that shows you basically how, what, what, the, what the system really is. So basically, how do you, how do you use Modena? You have uh, different scales. And usually you start from the macro scale. And when you execute macro scale simulation, this macro scale simulation has access to different uh, models that you can call within it. Uh, so uh, you can uh, run the lower scale uh, simulation from the uh, from the from the higher scale uh, from from the higher scale simulation that was uh, started, and you run it as long as the simulation is valid. Once the simulation starts stops being valid, or the model stops being valid. For example, you have to re-estimate the parameters that are using for the mesoscale simulation. Uh, you have to you have to stop the the workflow, and you have to dynamically change the workflow to make the model uh, to make the model usable again. And this is basically shown here. So the, the the main components are the scales of the model that you are using. So you can you can have here. In the documentation of Modena, it's usually mentioned that, uh, that we are using four scales: so nano, micro, meso, and macro scale, and that we have the communication uh, developed in between them. Uh, and then we have a database uh, that is here positioned here that uh, serves a central role in this in this in this platform, and that feeds the the, the necessary information and fetches the results from the simulation uh, when it when the, when the simu when the uh, when the simulation is being run so now let's talk about a bit about the about the database so the database is a central unit here in the in the uh in and we are using more database and basically what you do is you start your your workflow with a higher scale code and then you start to uh, start to iterate it can be uh, just a simple time loop and in this time loop you have to the to the models that the database in this case, uh, you are connecting database uh, with the adapters, and basically what you do is you take the model out of the database, you feed it into the higher scale code, you do the loop, use the model until uh, models being valid. For example, these models here are uh, the surrogate models, and these surrogate models uh, have to be fitted, right? And this uh, thing is done, on and uh, when your uh, surrogate you try to use the surrogate model for the parameters it's not fitted uh, to you and it tell you okay uh, you are trying to use uh, out of bound uh, re-estimate re the parameters and this is what happens here you will send the trigger uh, to database and uh, then, then the new uh, simulation will start here This code and it will or uh, your surrogate model for. Uh, once you know what parameters you have to use, uh, you can start with the lower scale simulations. And this is now uh, where the where the uh, where the where the fitting of the surrogate model starts. So you will run the uh, uh, lower scale code, and you will take the the data out of it, and you will fit your parameters. Once you Model is refitted. You can then start using it again in the in the higher scale code. Uh, Modena is based on a on a orchestrator uh, that is basically executing your workflows, and this uh, is based on a Python library called Fireworks. It's a very cool, uh, all different things, uh, and uh, 
It's, it's, very, it's, very, it's very interesting what, what it can do. Uh, but basically how it works is you create a fireworks. This is um, just an instruction that uh, you, would like to, you would like to execute. You feed this fireworks into the pad that is connected to a um, you, you can run it on cluster or, a, or, a, uh, or on your personal computer. And then this uh, launchpad is basically distributing the work uh, through different uh, computational resources. And you basically execute the code. Uh, there is this key thing called uh, FW action, and this uh, FW <coughs> workflow to the, the, the workflow itself. So basically, you can, according to some code from your, uh, from, your, from your platform or something like that, you can create uh, new uh, parts of the parts of the workflow. For example, if the Firefox one gets information about how to create a new uh, new part of the workflow, it can create it on its uh, on its own. And here is just a small example of how can this uh, uh, fireworks be uh, fireworks be uh, be defined. It's quite quite confusing, at least it was for me when 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 you talk about this because fireworks library is called fireworks, and then fireworks is as a, as a task you want to execute and then you have firework it, it's a bit it's a bit confusing but there is a nice uh, there is a nice uh, article which explains how it works and uh, what it does and why was it uh, created in the first place so it's the it's the doi here okay so uh at the code for the first time it was quite old as i told you five to six years nobody touched it and uh, we need to we need to move from this state to something that will be usable uh, and uh, uh, the biggest issue in this what i encountered was this c api part because you had to the, it's not only python because it's python that combines uh, that is that has uh, c wrappers and uh, that is com communicating a lot with the with the c part of the code and this changed a lot from python 2 to python 3 it's massive difference on how do you uh, how do you define uh, different things in it and how do you declare variables and all of these things and uh, uh, there was a, a large amount of work done on this to make it make it uh, usable with with uh, with Python three. Uh, also, uh, the way how you store things in Mongo database, I've shown you that uh, Mongo is the Mongo database here is is has the central role in 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 the whole platform, and this changed a lot as well. Uh, the the Python uh, package I'm using here is Mongo engine. There is a there are big, there are big, some significant differences in how how do you how do you how do you store things, how do you fetch things from the database and uh, things like that. There are also some differences uh, in uh, in fireworks and of course basic Python syntax. This makes uh, situation much easier for all of you who are interested in using it. So now we have a Modena Docker image. So um, what Docker does is it containerizes everything all of your uh, all of your uh, environment that you need for the platform to run and uh, you can just basically use it straight out of the box the only thing you need is you need to have docker uh, installed on your pc and uh, that's quite that's quite easy to do uh, and uh, once you uh, have the image you are able to create containers from it and uh, basically containers will be, allow you to uh, to use modena pretty much straight away you will not have all of these uh, things that have to go into the into the simulation because into the installation because it's not quite trivial to install this thing because you have the python part that has to be compiled you have the uh, you have to create your your own library you have to create a, you have to set up your python pad you have to give it access to c and all of these things it's uh, the most uh, pleasant installation i tried in 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 my life and now i would like to just give you a brief overview of uh, what the, the simple open form tutorial uh, will do here so basically have it's like it's a quite uh, everybody who who was in uh, engineering uh, uh, everybody knows this example so you have one tank with one pressure you have second tank with second pressure and you have a pipe that is connecting it and uh, then you have to basically call, compute how the pressure in one tank changes uh, and how the pressure in second tank changes and what what the what the what uh, what the flow sorry what the flow rate is doing yes exactly uh, so how would you do it you would basically write two ordinary differential equations and you will say okay my uh, flow rate is 
a function of uh, pressure difference, and uh, you would you would be able to compute it. But what if you can do something else? For example, what if you can uh, say, okay, I will still use the ordinary differential equations, but what I will do for the pipe is I will use CFD to compute the flow rate. So why not taking a okay? This is a very bad mesh. It's too coarse for this type of uh, this, this type of things. The boundary layer growth is uh, non-existent, but uh, it uh, serves the purpose. So what you can do is you can take your mesh, you can prescribe the the, uh, the boundary conditions. So you say okay, let's uh, fix the pressure on one side, let's fix the pressure on the other side, and let's see how the how the flow rate will change. Uh, and this is what what happens here is basically you at the macroscopic layer. Uh, what you do is you you start your uh, you start your uh, higher higher order model where you have these two uh, ordinary differential equations, uh, pretty much this uh, the mass in the mass uh, conservation in one tank and the, in the other, and uh, uh, at the microscopic scale you run the simulation. So you you make this communication with uh, with uh, with uh, Modena platform. Which will tell the open form simulation, okay, at the pressure changed, uh, and the new value is this. Put it on on one of the boundary patches. Do the same for the other, and re re compute my flow rate. Uh, then use this uh, uh, computed flow rate uh, and uh, the values from it to fit the the surrogate model I was talking about before. But basically, it will it will fit your surrogate model so that it can be used uh, uh, to compute the flux uh, uh, in this in the system of equation, and you will basically do that. And once the once the your surrogate model stops being valid when it, when you are trying to use it out of bounds on, or similar things, you will go back and repeat this. You will run a couple of uh, simple form uh, sim or whatever you want to use uh, simulations, and you will refit your surrogate model. And you will do this until something happens. Just a sanity check if uh, I'm doing something that makes sense or not. Uh, I'm just plotting the, the pressure here in the one tank and the, and the second tank. And of course, uh, first you have a val value of pressure one that is higher than the pressure two, and you see what happens. The good thing is, in the end, the pressure came to the same value. What we expect in the end, yes. If you if you leave the if you if you start the, this transient simulation and you what you expect is that the pressure in the tanks is going to go to the same value. So now the more complex part, and this is where we stopped with the, with the, with the, with the with the development of Modena. So how do we want to extend this to the web code project? So we have this is the, the situation. So you have a substrate. You have your anti-corrosion coating on top of it, and you have a defect on this uh, on this coating. And basically, what you see here is how the inhibitors that are contained in the in the coating uh, leach out of the coating itself, and how this uh, how these inhibitors will be used to uh, help uh, protect the the substrate at the defect. So this is what we have to simulate. So a couple of things, couple of scales. What we have, what we have to do here. So first of all, we have to define how good are inhibitors. So, and we do this by uh, uh, artificial intelligent machine learning model that is basically a whole bunch of chemicals uh, to be trained, and then it uh, predicts how good uh, your inhibition efficiency of these inhibitors is. Uh, furthermore, what we do is uh, we take a uh, it's a lattice Boltzmann uh, solver, basically simulating how do your inhibitors diffuse inside of the inside of the inside of the paint. So how are they moving inside of it? Because this is the uh, this is the, the 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 part that is needed in the final part of the final final part of the simulation. Uh, that is uh, finite element model that is basically doing just that. So how are the how are the um, inhibitors from the painting diffusing out and leaching out into the substrate into the defect and uh, we are then uh, taking a look how if this is uh, substantial to provide uh, corrosion protection at that place so a lot of different scales and we are we have the multi-scale uh, platform that dr rusha developed and uh, why not use it and why not put all of these scales inside and see what happens and how are these uh, uh, quite different uh, at the first glance 
something that is not so easy to merge together, how is this going to work? And uh, yeah, this is pretty much what we are struggling with now. We have the individual pieces, maybe not uh, at, the, at, the, at the complete state, but the bigger pr problem is how to pack it into the, into the workflow that will give you the results uh, uh, that, you, that you need here. And this is a couple of, uh, this is pretty much uh, showing you what, uh, what, I, what I talked about before. So uh, pretty much the machine learning model that is uh, computing the, the inhibition efficiency that you have uh, a quite uh, complex uh, uh, <laughs> simulation of how this uh, thing diffuse into the, into the, in, the, in, the, in the painting, because this information of how they uh, diffuse uh, 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 significant ingredient in the final step of view are taking a look how are the how are the inhibitors going to protect the the defected part of the of the of the of the coating a couple of uh, a couple of uh, references if somebody wants to take a look how to do numerics outside of open foam it's you can just take a look at at, at them Yes, and this is pretty much the last slide. So if somebody has questions and I didn't confuse you too much, please. <laughs> or even better, if somebody has questions, just ask Henrik. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, also, people from uh, the online audience, drop them in, in chat if you have them. Uh, so on the slide where you explain the communication with the database also, oh, we don't yeah. need the slide, it's okay. okay. Uh, so I understand correctly that you can kind of, uh, the idea is to sort of live during one simulation, launch another one, yeah. and then that gives back results to what has, let's say, triggered it. Mm -hmm. And it can, so it's kind of a, all going together at the same time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Yes, exactly. But uh, basically, what, what you would, you would like to avoid this type of things, but this is why you, why, why you use uh, surrogate models. So basically, at the beginning, you create your surrogate model, you instantiate it and store it in the database, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have this higher scale, scale code, and this goes very fast because you are using the surrogate representation of the model that you want to use. And you can use it until this is valid, right? And once mm -hmm. surrogate stops being valid, then you go outside of it. So this is where you where you catch the record, where it says catch return code and trigger design of experience. This is where you, when you go out, and uh, you have to go out to make your surrogate model valid again. And then you do all of these things with the design of experiment. You go back to the lower scale. This is then uh, running the similar, the open foam case uh, just to make it easy. And these are the exact simulations on on the left. Uh, what this does is it will create it will it will give you back the, the 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 parameters from the exact simulations that you will use to refit your surrogate model and once you refit it then it's going to start becoming valid again and you will you will be able to continue the simulation at, at, at the at the higher scale code so mm -hmm. the higher scale code will call surrogate models and when the surrogate model stop being valid you you call the refit of the of the of the of the surrogate models of course this can be extended and then uh, you can use uh, uh, so uh, other surrogate models you can have uh, I've shown you that we are planning to use four different models yeah. so then you need to just uh, pack it inside of this and uh, basically call it at the right place and fit refit it at the right place without breaking anything so hmm. hope this answers yeah, yeah, yeah okay anything else anybody else So if you do done the the, the, uh, the left part of the loop one time, it will obviously store uh, from that. Yeah. So you only for one particular um, area, right? So you the time you expand the valid parameter spaces. That is true. Over time you expand. Uh, the first time you enter, you have it fit at once. So. For how, how, so how does the, the, the process start? First, you uh, uh, initialize the models, and you will run a couple of uh, open form simulations in this case, and you will 
uh, fit your model. You will store these fitting parameters inside the database, and this will exist in the database. And then when you start the, the, this workflow here, uh, you will start using this what's in the database. And when the model starts being invalid, you will go out and you will repeat the initialization part. It's not the initialization part to extend the parameter the the surrogate model with additional parameters that yeah. you need for the fit got it so it will grow in size it will grow yes it... okay. yes hey okay, seems like there are no more questions i'll just check online audience Okay, seems like no. Yes, basically, with this, I would like to conclude this talk. And why? Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about how to about a technique we have been using at the University College Dublin in Ireland, in Ireland, for integrating Python codes into OpenCom <coughs> using uh, embedded an embedded Python, Python interpreter with PyBind 11. Um, we already, uh, or let's say that before saying anything on how we do this, uh, we would like to state that we already submitted a paper for the Open Form Journal, explaining or where we, uh, yeah, where we explain all of the details of how this is done. So, the paper is currently under the second round of, of reviews. Hopefully, it will be accepted in the, after this round and uh, and published soon. Uh, if you're interested in, the, I'm not going to go into the details of the of, of the code, but if you want, if you're interested interested on those details, you can go to the preprint because we, we already published it. So I am, and that's the link. So and by manipulating, and what we are going to talk about is how to manipulate open form fields with Python, but in open form. So I, and you can see a figure on the on your on the right hand side or on your left hand side where basically we're trying to explain or to make you easy to see what we mean and is that within an open form environment we want to take an open form field apply a python code on that open form field and produce a new open form field that we are going to use in the rest of the simulation so on the left hand side you can see a, an extremely simple example where we have a set of numbers that could easily represent that a velocity field and a three points match. And then we are using a Python code and producing uh, for calculating the velocity magnitude field. It's a tiny example just to show you how to do it. So, or, or what we mean when we say that, that we are manipulating the, manipulating the open form fields with Python code. Uh, how, do we, how did we get here? So that's a typical question. Why are you doing this? So the reason is that we are actually working on a solid mechanics project. project. And uh, in solid mechanics, to solve the momentum equation, but the momentum equation needs to be, or we need to provide closure by adding, uh, or by embedding a, a material model or a constitutive law that is basically a, re a, a relation between some variables. And uh, but the thing is that there is no material model uh, that is universally applicable to all of the materials. So we need to make a priori assumption about the form of that model, and we want to replace the typical numerical simulation model by removing that component and replacing it with a neural network that will be trained from experimental data or from microstructural simulations. So, and we hope that it, it, it will improve or it will reduce the error associated to simulations. And uh, so at this point, we had already a, a, a neural network, a Python-based neural network that was actually working for some, for some uh, let's say simple models in plasticity and we wanted to implement them in open form so we needed to come up with a way to do this there were several but there were several ways to do this we have even seen some of them here in the in the uh, in the workshop and uh we established some several rules when deciding how we wanted to do it the first was that uh, we didn't want to convert the python based neural network to c code we wanted to use it in python and also we wanted to, to interact to interact with the neural network using Python method, methods, not C++ methods. So we thought that possibly, or let's say that implementing that, we needed to be able to uh, embed a Python interpreter in, open, in C++ or open form, uh, exchange data with that Python interpreter, basically means send, send and receive it, and, uh, and then send Python commands to the, to the open, to, from open form from open form to the Python interpreter 
that could be executed on the data that the, that the interpreter received previously. And we found Py Pybind 11 offered all of them. So we gave it a try. And uh, Pybind 11 is a header only library. It is usually used for extending uh, the Python codes with C++, with C++ code. But you can do the opposite. And that, that's exactly what we are doing here. Uh, we're using it for, for basically, for, oh, it is providing the, fun the functionality I was saying. So <clears throat> we came up with this six X steps approach. It's relatively simple. Basically, uh, we start by running up an open simulation, as usual. At some point, we create a Python interpreter that is created, but it's not used. So it is basically existing, but we are not using it. Then we send inf uh, some information from open to the Python side. And then we execute, we send the command, the Python command that we want to be executed on that date. We wait until the execution is completed and then we retrieve the information back to the open form side and continue with the open form simulation. And uh, then we realized that there were several ways to do this if we are, if we are using Python 11. The first one, the first one called the passing by copy and uh, or, or we call it like that because Python 11 offers built-in support for converting uh, standard vectors in C++, in C++ to NumPy arrays but we needed to extract the information from the open form field and then we created the standard vector and then we convert it to a Py array that is a, basically a C type or a C compatible data that is directly transferable to the Python interpreter uh, as a NumPy array. We can also do the opposite, which is, we call it the reverse, con <laughs> reverse conversion, which takes the NumPy array and converts it into an open form field. And uh, but as you can imagine, this has a, a downside, and that is that we need to make copies, intermediate copies of the data. And that, eh, we were not really happy about that. So we came, we came up with the passing by reference approach which basically uh, removes the, the need to make the, the copies of the data. And uh, in order to do this, we needed to combine three different pieces of functionality, uh, C-types, which is a Python library that provides, uh, let's say, Python data types that are compatible with C. So for instance, C-types provide uh, pointers to doubles that are equivalent to the pointer to in, in C++, but the, you can use them in Python. We're also using the, the built-in support from the NumPy pack. So, and uh, basically what end, ends up happening is that every single open form field stores, the, the, stores its data as an underlying, underlying C style array. So basically we are creating a NumPy array and we are with the same data that is in the underlying array of the open form field. As, as I am showing here. So this has a, the particular advantage that one, once they are linked, if you do a modification on one side, it is immediately propagated to the other side. So there is no overhead. So with these two approaches, we gave it a try. In the paper, we are presenting three, three test cases. The first one is possibly the hello world of OpenFOAM. It's implementing a boundary condition. We are implementing a a sinusoidal you can see it there the question we are running i on the classic cavity case with that boundary condition the velocities on the boundary are given but by that equation is a sinusoidal equation that depends and on the spatial coordinate and also on the time and uh basically there are four steps to or following four steps to for implementing that the first one is the within the boundary const the, within the constructor of the boundary condition we initialize the python interpreter and we load a Python script, where you can see it here. So basically that script has the, inform the code that you are seeing there. It basically defines a calculate function that takes the, the, phase, the coordinates of the, phase, of the centers of the phases on the boundary and the time, and, cal and calculates the velocities as given by the equation that you are seeing above. Of course, as I said, I'm not going into the details of code, but it's extremely simple and it's boilerplate. If you copy and paste it, it is going to work. And also, we are providing the the we are providing the GitHub repository with this and with on the environment that makes it really easy to reproduce. So within the update code of the boundary condition uh, function, in, in that function, we are simply passing the information, all of 
this code that you are seeing here is passing the information from OpenFOAM to the Python interpreter by copy. In this first example, I'm showing only the, the by copy approach. Then uh, we're saying we're say, uh, letting Python know what command we want to, to be applied on the data. In this case, the command is given by this. Velocities, uh, or basically what it says is that the velocities are defined as the result from applying the calculate function that we defined first when the phase sentence and the time. And finally, this code is retrieving the information back to OpenFOAM. So yeah, we implemented that, and this is the classical case. You can see on, the, on your left-hand side, you can see the result for the velocity and pressure magnitude fields. Clearly, the, the sinusoidal equation was implemented on the boundary. And on the right-hand side, you can see the results for the velocity along the top boundary at the final time. Uh, and you can compare the, the one we implemented with the, with the expected, with the analytical one. It's basically a really good agreement. We run the problem in, in several, with several cores also to analyze the parallel performance. And uh, basically, it was the speed up the same. We were using Python, and when, when we were not using it, it was very good because uh, we, we weren't sure about what was going to happen in this case. What is happening here is uh, that um, every single processor creates a copy of the Python interpreter. So they are independent. They are not clashing with each other, which is very nice. And uh, it also means that the passing by copy could be an, an interesting alternative, even, if it, even when it is making intermediate copies. Because apparently, it is not in this case, it is not adding a lot of overhead. And this, this is you can read test case three, and you might be wondering where is test case two? Well, in the paper, because I had to remove it for for the sake the sake of the time. But in in test case two, we are prototyping, we are implementing a, a numerical method or numerical scheme in Python instead of C So, but this. Basically, this is the start of the paper. This problem is the most extensive one. We run several, uh, several. We run it by copy of a reference, and it's a solid mechanics application. We have a plate with a circular hole in the center, loaded by uniform tension on the right hand, right hand side on the right boundary, and, in it, and it has symmetry on the left and on the bottom. But more than that, what's important here is that uh, we are doing in this what I said before. We're solving the momentum equation that you can see here. And uh, we are using as a material model the linear elastic Hookean law, which, which is a relation between a stress and a strain. So, and we are implementing that material model in Python. So we are basically modifying solids for foam so that it involves executing Python at every single iteration. So uh, I would like to point out here that this is a solid mechanics application, but this is actually the same that you're doing a fluid mechanics problem. There is no difference. Uh, let's say this problem conceptually is the same that, for instance, implementing a turbulence model that is based on a neural network. So, so yeah, it's easy to extend it to fluid mechanics applications. Uh, but here we added, as I said before, we want to use neural networks in our solutions uh, loops. So we replace the model with a neural network. We train a neural network in Python using Keras, and uh, then we use the we use the neural network as a surrogate model for the for the material model. This is the workflow of the neural network. is I would say it's really typical of what well, basically is is really simple. We take the strain tensor. It undergoes a, a scaling process where it is restricted to the range zero one. And that enters a neural network and that produces the, the scale version of the stresses. And those stresses are back to the natural range. And, uh, but we, were, we already had the neural network. We were able to run Python code in form. But there were several do, ways to do that. So, and there is no standard to do that in open form. So we tested several ways. The first one is, well, all of them are Python based. By this time, we have solved. Uh, we, have, we have already removed the C++ uh, part of the code. And uh, but the first one was was this 
was not using machine learning at all. So we took the linear, linear elastic hook and law, and we simply wrote a Python script, really simple, that is actually executing the same, uh, or it's performing the same operations that we are expecting to be, to be performed from. In the second case, we literally uh, already implemented the neural network. You can see that first we are loading the scalars that we use when training it. And then we simply are, uh, if you read the code, it's simply a scale, a predict, a scale back, and return. And that's it. So yeah, for the sake of, uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going into the details, but feel free to reach me out if you, want, if you are interested on that, or, or maybe to read the paper, the preprint of the paper. In the third case, well, we're, at this point, we weren't happy about the performance of some of the cases, and we were looking for alternatives to accelerate the code. So and we read somewhere, uh, where I'm referencing in the paper where we read it, that we shouldn't use the dot predict syntax of Keras for making the predictions, but it would be beneficial if we, re, if we constructed a new neural network using the same layers that we had used in the first one. So, but in this case, the neural net, the new neural network would be based on the functional API of, of Keras and not on the sequential API that we had used before. And we did that, so we gave it a try. We also read that there is something called uh, eager execution uh, environment in TensorFlow. That, and we read that if you set it to disable, the code is also accelerated and there were, there were like, there were several uh, comparisons over there. So we gave it a try and you can see that here. So this is the fourth case. We also tried not using the TensorFlow-based neural network, but using a NumPy-based version of the same neural network, but only involving uh, NumPy operations. And that's given by the code that you see on the right. There is no Keras over there or TensorFlow, it's only NumPy. But it's exactly the, the same, the same uh, neural network with the same hyperparameters and all of that. So, and we use the Keras converter. Converter is like, it's, that's a library, it's open source, and it takes a um, TensorFlow to a succession of, of NumPy operations. At this point, yeah, I would like to tell you that there is a 0.6 because we actually run the same code using Numba that is supposed to, that is a JIT compiler for NumPy. It is supposed to accelerate this code, but in our results, some of them, some of the cases were accelerated and some of them were not. So it, we couldn't make a good conclusion about that and we prefer to remove that. So, but yeah, but we also tried with Numba. You can see the results on the right hand side is on the, on your left. You can see the, the expected results, the ones from solid perform on the right hand side. You can see the results for all of, for all the tested approaches and solid perform. Basically, in all the cases, the results are in very agreement with solid perform, which is good. And uh, in terms of the time that running the code takes, uh, yeah, we can say that the first conclusion we got is that the NumPy-based neural networks are actually considerably slower than the, than the other neural networks. And uh, also, we were expecting the neural networks to be slower than the analytical expression because they, they involve more floating point operations. But it's interesting that in the passing by copy case, they add an overhead, but it's not that much. So depending on the application, it could be interesting to use pass by copy. But passing by reference basically remove, I would say most, almost all of the overhead. If you compare, the, the solid for fun results with the analytical Python results, it's almost the same. And we're talking that it is all of the operations in the, in the analytical expression were performed in Python. And they are pro producing almost the same result, which is very good. But also the other neural networks, but the NumPy one, if, you, if we analyze the base, the one based on the base neural network, and the one, ba the one based on functional and the one with eager disabled, all of them are actually producing very good timing results, which is nice. Well, but yeah, we, we were not happy at this point either. So, because we, uh, we thought that the, my, maybe the developer 
wouldn't want or would prefer not to know how to combine C types and NumPy and all of that for sending information to and fro. So we came up with this uh, library application that we call PyCompal. And uh, basically, it's a high level wrapper that hides all of the difficulty that we are, I've been trying to not to talk about here. So, and, and it's the process of communicating extremely simple. So for you, you only have to download the pythonpal.h file. It's already uh, free, uh, available. And within that file, we are defining a pythonpal class. And that class has three met methods. Of course, the constructor. The constructor, you can see it here. And it receives uh, the name of a Python script. Basically, that, that in that Python script, we are defining the Python function that we are going to use later in OpenFOAM whenever we want. We are also defining a pass to Python method, where basically we say, or we say, this is the, our, the open form field that I want to pass to Python, and it will execute Python. You don't have to do anything else. And we also, we're also defining an execute method that basically says, well, this is the command in Python I want to execute on the, on the data, and that's it. And all, if done, all of this is done by uh, using the pass by reference approach, so it's basically there is no overhead associated with it. And uh, yeah, we we also are showing one uh, or or we all are in are sharing one of the well, a tutorial case. We call it the Python pile icophone because basically we took icophone, and after the simulation is is done, we are passing the velocity field to the Python side uh, with the Python with the Python pal, and we're calculating the velocity the specific kinetic energy. So the square divided by two in Python. The process is extremely simple. We define, first we create a specific kinetic energy field. This is basically copy and paste. It's exactly the same code for creating the P field, the picture field. We only change the P by a K, and that's it. Then we include Python pal here, the, and that's it, in our code, in Nikofon. Then we create an instance of the Python pal class. We call it my pal, and we, and we pass the name of a Python script. The, the Python script defines a Python function here, which basically receives field. In this case, it will receive the velocity field and returns the specific kinetic energy. Um, take the open form field name u and create the same in the Python side with the same name, u. That's what we are doing here both for u and for k. And once it is linked with, with Python, we simply say k will be the result from applying calculating k with the, when pass the u field. And we write the results. We, re, we, order, we again ra, uh, run the classic cavity case, and these are the results, which are the ones we were expecting. So yeah, with this, I am, I am concluding. Uh, in, I would like to say that basically, Summarizing, we introduced an approach for running Python codes in OpenFOAM. So, and we're also introducing pass, or we talked about the passing by reference approach, passing by copy approach, and, the, and about Python pal. And we showed an example where, or a real example where we replaced, uh, where we included a neural network in a Python or in an OpenFOAM workflow. And uh, I would like to say thank you to our supporters the Irish Research Council, and uh, who basically that's the, our funding body, Baker, which is one of the project affiliates, and the Irish Research Irish Center for Hype and Computing. And I would like also say, I would like to say thank you to some of the previous who's inspired this one, like Andre. I saw several here, Bernard, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. That's it on my side. So if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to, to answer them. Right. So I just want to know where the, um, the Python script that you're executing lies in existence, like relative to your case. Does it lie in the case directory or is there somewhere else it needs to go? And also I'm presuming that then allows you to change your Python code without having to change your C++ code so you can yeah, exactly. have your C++ and you don't have to recompile every single time. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, good. You can, 
there are several ways you can, you can simply put your Python code in the working folder and that's it. But you could also say, well, it is not on the working folder, but somewhere somewhere else. So that's a possibility. We went with the easiest one. But yeah, you, we should be able to create an, an additional method. Maybe I didn't show it here, but Python PAL, this is version zero. So basically, we are only providing really, really uh, needed methods, I would say. But we could extend it in the future. And, and you said the second, I think, is uh, how to change the code at run yeah, yeah. runtime? So yeah. 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 Exactly. That's exactly what I do when I am testing the cases. I don't change the, for instance, in the icofunk, I don't change it. I only change the Python code, and uh, I in I showed six different approaches for the neural network, and I basically I only compiled once, and then I was only changing the Python script. Which is really, really, really nice, especially when the code takes a long time for compiling. So, yeah. Any other question? Oh. I have a small one. How can we get the code? Uh, which one? Because there, Both. basically, there are. Yeah. yeah. There are there are two repositories. One for. Yeah, I mean. We're submitting this to the Open Form Journal. It's already in the second, under the second round of reviews. So, so basically, the code is already available. I provided the link to the preprint, and in the preprint, there is the, the you can see the, you can find the link to to the GitHub to the Bitbucket repository where everything is. And there is also, I, I actually I recorded a video on for the Python Palicofoam. You can also look for it in YouTube if you are interested. Because I know that sometimes you copy the code and then you paste it and it doesn't work. Because, for instance, the, yeah, the, maybe one of your signs is not the same uh, as it is in the original code. I hate when that happens. So I prefer to record a video and I am showing everything. So you can look, look for it on YouTube if you want. It's uh, something I think it's Python PAL tutorial or something like that. But everything is already shared. So and the only, yeah, when I came up with the name, I was thinking that this is a class that is in the middle of Python and OpenFOAM, so it was really nice, Python PAL. But then I, I realized that after I, sh I released the code, I realized that if you Google Python PAL, there are like, I don't know, maybe 300 application, applications in other domains named Python PAL. So yeah, so maybe I should do the, that on that side. But yeah, we, in theory, maybe Python PAL OpenFOAM or something like that, and it should be easy to, to find it. Or, or looking for my former profile on research gate, there is also everything. But you can also, if you want something here, you can also reach me out or Philip. Philip is super nice. So, yeah. So, hopefully, you will find it useful. I think it, it is. I really liked it, how clean it became at the end of, for running the neural networks. So, hopefully, hopefully, you will find it useful also. Okay. Let me. Another question. So, wait, 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 wait. so I see you have performance comparison by passing by copy and passing by reference, and there's no much difference to be honest. So, how do you think? Where do you gain from by using passing by copy? Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Also, but the thing is that the problem maybe I. We couldn't see it here because I only showed the results for the fine mesh. And what if you run the same case on the on a coarser mesh, maybe the ratio is not that good as I showed it here. So and the reason is that the the time that that open form needs for loading TensorFlow is is constant. So let's say three seconds or something like that. So three seconds in a simulation that that lasts five, it's a lot of overhead. But when you run it on a on a fine mesh, you actually uh, that is not important, but, but because it's a constant time that is not escalating with the with the number of points. So, yeah, maybe maybe yeah, maybe the difference was not that uh, appreciable here, but I think it, it you could see it if you if we if you read the paper and you see the results for the coarse mesh. I don't know if there is any other question about this. I think that nobody from the online audience 
Well, thank you very much. Then. Uh, oh, comment sorry. online, comment. Yeah, Hello, can just read thank my you for the stuff. Yeah. Okay. After him. Uh, yeah. after, okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Actually, I have a, a small doubt. For example, the last example you gave, yeah. uh, where you are calculating the the k, yeah. you are writing a field in open form that in the in the end you are getting your field that it's k in open form. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because maybe yeah. If I can do a better job explaining that here, it's, it's like, yeah. Uh, can you help me here? Okay. Yeah, when here we are defining the K field, and after that it, it will always it will exist. So when I executed this command over here, pass to Python KK. I'm saying that whatever happens in one of the case, either the open form or the Python one, will affect, will be will be happening to the other one. So without without extra uh, computations, because they are sharing the underlying data. So yeah. So. Okay. Can you just ask again the online audience uh, what you Yeah, I somebody online wanted to ask something. If you can uh, ask us again, please. Just open your. Hey. Your microphone. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, just quick question. What was your biggest surprise in developing this? Uh, I would say that I wasn't expecting it to be. I wasn't expecting the results for the analytical the analytical expressions to be so close to each other. I was expecting a more important overhead in the Python side. I would say, because I, I mean, running. I was expecting Py, the Python code to be way slower than the C plus plus. And yeah, in general, Python is slower. But depending on the calculation that you are performing, actually, it might be it might not be that uh, important. Yeah, usually on the other exactly. But yeah, well, actually, if you don't use NumPy properly, you could end up doing something that is extremely slow. So that's another thing. I in, in, in the paper, for instance, uh, or in in the review process of our paper, one of the reviewers uh, actually gave us a piece of advice that was very good because we were performing one of the operations and uh, and, and he said if you change this operation with an by a numpy vectorized operation it will be faster and we tried and it was uh, orders of magnitude the, the difference was orders of magnitude but in the in the neural network it didn't we didn't need that because I had already implemented it in the via the the, the, the vectorized operations so so yeah it wasn't I wasn't expecting the 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 results from the time perspective to be so close to, close to each other. I would say that was the biggest surprise. Thank you. Appreciate it. OK. There was still Mark. There's an opportunity for that. OK. Uh, now, uh, I have more curiosity. So uh, the solid mechanics uh, simulation are very short in time. So but if you try to use this uh, in a um, fluid dynamic simulation, which can take month, months, uh, do you think that it will be much slower uh, or basically the same time? OK, uh, thank you. Well, actually, I think it should be the same time because basically what what we what our results are telling us that uh, our results are telling us that there is no if you use pass by reference, there is not an important overhead. So it should be, I would say it should be, it should be around the same order of magnitude, I would say. We, and that's what's important. But because maybe if I run the, the case several times, maybe in some cases the, the C times the C time the C plus plus execution is slower in one of the cases, for instance. But if I run it a hundred times, it's always in on average, it's always faster. So yeah, I would say that if the Python operation and the C++ operation are taking a similar time, I wouldn't I wouldn't be expecting that it is that the overhead is actually that important. Also, it is, of course, it is also case dependent because, for instance, it's not the same only calculating in Python the boundary field than calculating the entire field as I did in the third case. So it might be also. I think that we have some other questions from the online. 
Okay. Another person online wanted to ask something, I guess. You can simply open your microphone and. Uh, excuse me, if you have already uh, answered this first, uh, you mentioned you speak up? the paper. Uh, do you hear me? Yep, thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry if you have already answered this, but you mentioned the uh, paper that is reviewed. Is the paper published that we could read or access? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually in the first, yeah, maybe I, I went too fast over that, but on the first slide, I am showing the, the link to the preprint. <coughs> so let me show you. Thank you, Marco, for the assistance. Uh, yeah, that's the link to the preprint. To the preprint, and uh, yeah, we have you can get there and read. And in the in that preprint, you can read. You can there is the link to the Bitbucket repository, and you can download the code and run everything. And uh, we are also providing the conda environment, so. And we are also providing a Docker image, so we should be able to, there, there should be no problem for re reproducing the results. Thank you. No worries. Not sure if there, is there any other question about it? If not, I would like to say thank you for your time, for your attention in the last session of the workshop. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, Simon, for a very, very interesting talk. It's nice to see that Python is getting some love. OK, so uh, this is it then, the last session of the last day. Thank you very much for joining us. And with this, I would like to conclude the session. Yes, bye bye.